Okay. Are we live? Okay, hold on. Yeah. All right. You tell me when we're ready. We're probably on. I'm Dr. David Goddard. And Dr. H.L. Greenberg, and we'd like to welcome you to our fourth edition, fourth round of Durham Bros Live, which is our virtual happy hour during the quarantine. And once we get this open, we'll get everything started. So today is, uh, this is the month of May, and May is psoriatic or Arthritis Awareness Month, and so for our theme this week, we were going to talk about psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, and some of the related skin conditions. It's so close. I'll go for Monday. Oh, Bob. For Becca. <laughs> so this will be for you. Thank you. And what, are, what do we have here today? This is only sparkling cider because we we're out of uh, the champagne, which exactly. we've had the past two weeks. But we'll get it going. Big kahuna. I think I have the wrong cup. No, no, that's yours. <laughs> yeah, because I'm the dermatology diva. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> All right. So we we're board certified dermatologists at Las Vegas Dermatology. This is our fourth round. Uh, we started off sort of free forming and answering questions, and we decided as we move forward to sort of theme it out. So as this is something we treat commonly in our clinic, and it's a very common skin condition and uh, we just hope to educate you a little bit more about what we deal with here and how we deal with it. Exactly. So psoriasis is one of the many dermatologic diseases that I know when I see it, kind of in those famous words of uh, Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart. But today we're going to transcend that colloquialism, Dr. Greenberg, and go into a little more detail about what makes psoriasis psoriasis, how we identify it as dermatologists, how we treat it, as well as talk about some of the related conditions such as psoriatic arthritis and a few rashes that are commonly mistaken as psoriasis. So a little bit of background, psoriasis is very common. It affects between four and five percent of Americans here in the United States, so about one in 25 people. It usually will show up kind of between ages 20 and 50, so there's a younger curve and an older curve. So we see patients across all age gaps that have psoriasis. About 20 to 30 percent of these patients will actually have psoriatic arthritis, which we'll talk a little more about later. Dr. Greenberg has some outstanding slides that go through the details of how destructive that process can be. Sure, and, and psoriasis is common, uh, and it's commonly misunderstood by people. So when people see it, uh, they're confused. They don't know what it is if they've never seen it for the first time. Uh, some children uh, aren't allowed in swimming pools by people who are ignorant toward the disease, thinking that it's contagious. Uh, and that it's somehow like some, some condition that's gonna cause problems to other people, and it's not. Exactly. It, yeah, it's an individual condition characterized by these uh, silver-scaled plaques on an erythema face. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up in terms of the social stigma and people just not knowing. I mean, I remember being a dermatology resident at UC San Diego Medical Center and getting a stat, stat consult to an outpatient surgery center because a patient had this horrible rash and they weren't sure if they could cut into it. And it was psoriasis. They thought it was a bad infection. Maybe the patient needed IV antibiotics. But you know, having the expertise to be able to look at something, know what it is, and how to treat it, and really, in that day, change that person's life. We were able to get them their surgery done. Sure. And if you've never seen it, uh, it can be confusing. And sometimes, even having seen multiple cases, and I've been you know, in practice for quite some time now in Las Vegas. Even sometimes for me, it's difficult to diagnose. And sometimes you actually do need the biopsy to determine what it is. So here are a few of the different faces of psoriasis. These are a few patients that we've seen here in this clinic. We see lots and lots of psoriasis. Dr. Greenberg is an expert in psoriasis. He's done psoriasis research. And um, it can have many different faces. And again, to his point, sometimes not all psoriasis is created equal. And looking a little further, maybe doing a skin biopsy can be helpful. And in this case, there's even a picture of someone with nail psoriasis. And I know that's something that you you. Sure. We, well, we both we both see it every day, so it's not just one of us that diagnoses it. Uh, I've just been at it a little bit longer, but uh, Dr. Cotter's knowledge in this area is, is quite impressive, and that's why we decided to work together. Uh, you have multiple pictures here. Uh, you can see psoriasis on the body, psoriasis on the scalp, on the arm. Uh, on the nail, there are some characteristic changes that you see, oil spots. Uh, distal anecholysis, where the, the nail's lifting up off the nail bed, and uh, uh, anachoschisia, you can see where the nail's just sort of falling apart. Yeah, absolutely. It fits. There's a lot of different rashes that can be confused with psoriasis, and here we just picked a few of kind of red scaly or big scaly rashes. The top rash on the face is actually seborrheic dermatitis, which I like to kind of describe as psoriasis's younger brother or younger sister. 
And there's a lot of overlap between seborrheic dermatitis and psoriasis. They're both red, they're both scaly, they can affect the face, the scalp. Um, seborrheic dermatitis is much more mild and much easier to treat. It can also affect the chest. And this patient here, shown here along the, the surgical scar, had had this rash for over a year post-op after he had his open heart surgery. And he was like, I have no idea what it is, no one knows what it is. And a couple of weeks of topical steroids and some antifungal shampoo melted it away for him. And then the next one on the trunk, the red scaly papules there, is actually syphilis. And an interesting fact, I'm sure you know, you've heard this story, Dr. Greenberg, Dermatology used to be called dermatology and venerology. Dermatologists were the original syphilologists, syphilolo meaning did the initial descriptions of syphilis and syphilis-like rashes. And anytime you see a horrible rapid onset case of psoriasis, you need to think about, well, could this actually be a fulminant syphilis case? Sure. Um, because they can look very, very similar. Um, and it's very important to distinguish. Oh, for sure. And what about this last one? Yeah, the last one was a patient I've seen in clinic, and it's something commonly seen right around this time of the year, and it's called pityriasis rosea, and usually you get one herald patch, a large uh, plaque-like eruption on the back with sort of a Christmas tree distribution falling down of smaller lesions, which can imitate guttate psoriasis, which is psoriasis guttate, meaning these little uh, circular plaques that people get. And it can be confusing as to which is which, and sometimes you treat them the same, but uh, the pityriasis rosea usually just runs its own course, and whereas psoriasis usually responds better to medication. Absolutely. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, Allison Hirsch, 1104, is asking, is psoriasis guttate an autoimmune disease? If so, how can it be treated? Um, yeah, that's an outstanding question. So psoriasis is considered an auto-inflammatory disorder because you have inflammation in your skin, you have a misbehaving immune system. And to get down to the nitty gritty, really nerdy about it, you have these special cells called plasmacytoid dendritic cells that identify things that shouldn't be in the skin. And then they take them and show them to your T cells, which are immune effector cells that usually fight infections. To truly be autoimmune in nature, you need to have a self antigen. So a self molecule, something inside your skin or your body that your immune system targets. To date, there's never been a self antigen or basically a self molecule that's been identified to trigger psoriasis. So it's more better classified as an auto inflammatory condition because there's inflammation attacking your own skin. And that creates kind of a cascade of effects um, involving hyperproliferation of the epidermis. So, a fun fact normally it takes about one month for a cell in the bottom of your epidermis, the stem cells, to get all the way to the top to turn into the stratum corneum, which is the dead layer. In patients with psoriasis, that can happen in six days. So it can be four to five times faster than normal, which is why the skin builds up and you get these big, thick plaques. So no, it's not technically an autoimmune disease, at least yet, because we haven't identified an antigen. Sure, and guttate psoriasis sometimes uh, can come about after you have a strep infection. So you get an infection, and all of a sudden you have full-blown psoriasis that comes out after that. And we see that commonly, and it can be treated differently. You clear the strep, you may clear the psoriasis, depending on if, if that's what triggered it. Uh, in terms of it being transmitted in, in family members, uh, it can be. It, you can have uh, a genetic component to it, but it's not necessarily the case that everybody who has it has a parent who has it. Designer Baby 95 also asks, what are your most used biologics and why? Oh, we're gonna get into those. There's, uh, there's so many and it depends on your comorbid conditions, in other words, what other things do you have going on as to which biologic you're gonna use? Yeah, that's, that's definitely the best answer. It's an exciting landscape. There's 11 specific monoclonal antibodies, specific targeted therapies, and really it depends on what the patient has and what's safe for them. Oh, so, so these are uh, patients with nail psoriasis. Uh, the top left one was the first one we saw initially. That's the oil spotting under the nails. You can see nail pitting on the second image near our logo. And then uh, the anekoskesia, the, the breaking off of the nails, some spooning on this one is what it looks like, which is usually with uh, iron deficiency. Exactly. I always do a nail exam on every psoriasis patient. I know Dr. Greenberg does too. And the reason why is if you have nails, nail psoriasis, you're much more likely to have psoriatic arthritis. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important um, pickup for dermatologists because if you have psoriatic arthritis, you may end up treating the psoriasis different because you have to protect the joints as well. Yeah, and this is, uh, this is not our case, this is uh, Dr. Gary Feldman's case, but this is pre and post treatment and we don't know what they treated the patient with, but presumably a, D a DMARD, which is disease modifying uh, medication that 
uh, affected this patient's nail psoriasis, but also the joints and the psoriatic arthritis. So uh, the medication that you use can enhance and improve your life depending on what you have going on. But if you had joint pain and psoriasis and psoriasis of the nails, you're gonna want a systemic agent. Absolutely. It's important to pick up psoriatic arthritis sooner than later. This is a picture of a case of someone who has really debilitating psoriatic arthritis. You can see that the, the fingers are severely deformed. And on the next slide, you can even see the x-rays that show the obliteration of the bones and the bony spaces leading to the clinical response of having finger deformities, inability to use the digits, and sometimes a lot of pain. Yeah, and they call it the pencil and cuff deformity is, is something classically seen on x-ray. We, as dermatologists, generally don't order x-rays. We'll try to partner with our rheumatology colleagues, but uh, it's not unreasonable to do just to check the extent of disease. And when they do the clinical trials for these drugs, uh, x-rays are important because certain of the drugs do show improvement. So back to your question earlier about how do you pick a treatment? Do you use biologics? Which one is your favorite? The landscape is vast. Our breadth and depth of understanding of psoriasis and how to treat it has expanded exponentially in the last 10 to 20 years. We have molecules in all kinds of different classes, and we both prescribe molecules from every single class. Some of them are kind of the ancestral biologic treatments for psoriasis or TNF-alpha inhibitors. TNF-alpha is kind of a master regulator of inflammation throughout the body, and specifically in the skin as well. And you can target that and you can shut down psoriasis. One of the earlier medications was actually, um, it's not listed here because it's not available anymore, but some, some of the earlier ones that we still use quite often are Enbrel or Tenercept and Humira, Adalimumab. Simzia came around a little later. It's very great, and we'll talk about that in relation to special circumstances. Sure. But then going forward in time, we have more specific agents. Dr. Greenberg, do you want to mention something? Well, uh, you know, Stellara's been around. It's for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And that was one of the first agents that did that with uh, every three month injections, which uh, for some patients who are needle phobic or don't want to be injected, having uh, an agent like that is helpful. Uh, another agent that was uh, really exciting, when, at least to me when it first came around, is the PDE4 inhibitor of Tesla, which um, it's not a biologic drug, but it does affect inflammation within the cell. And so uh, with psoriasis, it's thought that there's increased inflammation, we talked about that, and it's an anti-inflammatory acting within the cell to reduce inflammation. Uh, some people can't tolerate it because of GI upset. It does happen. Some people get depression. So every drug, for every drug, there's a different side effect and different things that you need to look out for. Exactly, and there's different indications. Dr. Greenberg touched on the IL-1223 inhibitor, ustekinumab or Stellara, being duly approved for psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis. For example, with Tesla, the medication you were talking about, it's actually an oral, oral medicine, so it's a pill, but it's also duly approved for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. The IL-17 inhibitors listed here, Cosentix, Secukinumab, um, Taltixikizumab, and then um, Salik Verdalumab are all approved for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis as well. So picking a medicine for a patient may be influenced by which diseases they have. Sure, and, and, and those ones are really good. If somebody has an, an uh, autoimmune condition, like you talked about before, like multiple sclerosis, you can use a drug like that. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas some of the other drugs, it's contraindicated. So, I mean, it seems kind of confusing and how do you keep it all straight, but I think Dr. Greenberg has a great approach in terms of thinking about how you, how you can choose these different medications. So when I was at Texas A&M, I, uh, I, I went and heard a lecture and, uh, well, I'm not gonna go all into it, but my program director, when I told him about my lecture, I said, what a, what a great lecture, Dr. Butler, I really, you know, really enjoyed this lecture. And, and uh, the doctor who spoke, he said his tool was, was the knife. And uh, Dr. Butler, who's my program director, says, well, Greenberg, don't you forget, your tool is your brain. So uh, it's important to think about these drugs because uh, whichever drug you use, whichever way you go about treating somebody is gonna make a massive impact on their life. And you know, choosing the wrong drug could have really severe consequences. Absolutely. Um, Designer Baby 95 has a follow-up question stating, do you use the class of IL-23? Sure, so two back. Uh, the, tw the 23 inhibitors are the, are the latest drugs and they are fantastic. In terms of just clearing psoriasis, uh, they, they clear psoriasis probably better than all the other drugs. Yeah, I think they work very fast. They're highly effective. There's Skyrizi, Trifia, Lumia. I think all three are outstanding medications and 
the specific one you might pick for a patient may be influenced by what's covered by their insurance, and may be influenced by how frequently they can tolerate an injection, um, but they all work outstanding. None of them are approved for psoriatic arthritis. Yeah, I think, that, uh, I think that Term 5 is going for that indication. I, I don't think that SkyRizzy is right now. And Illumia, um, there, there's been you know, some data recently released on pregnant women with that. So, uh, this is a classic case of uh, psoriasis. Uh, the next two cases are actually both seen on the same day, two different people, but these are the silver scale, scale plaques on their thymidus base, and for somebody who has this much involvement on their entire trunk, it's gonna be difficult for them just to put a cream on to treat their disease because there's so much body involved that you're gonna spend all day with the creams. The plaques are thicker, the skin is thicker in psoriasis. Um, so yes, you could use, use the cream, the steroid cream, which over time can thin the skin. You do want it thinned out a little bit because right now it's so thick. But also the systemic agents are probably where I would go and probably where the patient would go with this. In the past, we had done a lot of light therapy where I had trained and, and other drugs like methotrexate but they're safer drugs and you know, light therapy is sort of falling out of favor because of the risk of uh, skin cancer, although narrowband UVB seems to have less of a risk. Yeah, so for the sake of, um, just a, as an example, if this was just a young, healthy man um, with 10% body surface area psoriasis kind of looking like this, we call him moderate to severe, he'd probably be a candidate for just about any one of the drugs that we've spoken about. Mm -hmm. But then if you added something like psoriatic arthritis, you might approach him a little differently, right? Yeah, no question about it. So. Uh, a systemic agent like all the ones that we touched on but that are indicated for psoriatic arthritis you would do in this case. Um, Allison Hirsch 1104 on Instagram is asking what are the downsides of biologics? Well, well so it depends on the, the specific medication. So if we're talking about TNF alpha inhibitors they have some certain concerns they're called black box warnings because the FDA has included certain specific warnings in the label for those medications. TNF alpha inhibitors have warnings for um, cancer, malignancy, increased risks of infections, and the infectious risk is true across all of the biologic medications, um, the injectable ones, as well as um, TNFs have the warning for exacerbation of heart failure, and they are particularly safe to use in patients with a history of an autoimmune um, demyelinating disorder or central nervous system disorder, like multiple sclerosis. And, and for all of these drugs, uh, except for Tesla, which is a system for the system, systemic agents and methotrexate and isotretin too, uh, you want to check for TB. Mm -hmm. So we do a quantifuron test, and the reason we do a quantifuron test is sometimes when you place a PPD, it's difficult to read, and you get these indeterminate uh, PPDs, whereas a quantifuron is a blood test that shows whether you've been exposed to TB. And the reason that's important is if you, you can get reactivation of TB with these drugs. I've also, I, I've probably seen every side effect with all of these drugs, including MS-like side effects, uh, where somebody starts to lose sensation in, in a limb and they have to get an MRI of the brain. So when that happens, you have to stop the drug. You know, every, any drug can cause any side effect and we, we take it seriously when somebody complains about a symptom that they're having with these drugs. There's no guarantees with anything. So uh, I've even seen it where people on methotrexate, they've dropped their white cap completely and uh, they had to be put in intensive care. So, yeah, no, these are serious medications. Yeah, there's side effects to everything, but one of the exciting things is as we develop newer and more effective and safer medications, we have more options to treat our patients. And for some people that um, have had, you know, been excluded from medications in the past, like for example, this is not this case, but this is a case of a patient who has bad enough psoriasis to justify a systemic agent. And probably once a month, I'll get a patient in who has been you know, doing whatever for the last 10 or the last 20 years because they were told 10 or 20 years ago, oh, well, you're not a candidate for one of those injectable medicines because of your history of breast cancer or your history of MS or your history of heart failure. And they'll come in and say, oh, I just need a refill of my steroid doc. I know that I can't get one of those cool new medicines. And we'll say, hey, well, this is a new time. Let me talk to you about an IL-23 inhibitor sure. or a Tesla or an IL-17 inhibitor. And we're routinely starting patients that used to not qualify for those medications on newer biologic agents and we're changing their lives. Yeah, today I had a patient who has been on, she has psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, has been on all of the TNFs, has been on Stelara, has been on, I'm trying to think which other one, uh, has been on all this, IL-17s, TNFs, Stelara, and so I started her on Zelgans today, which is a JAK inhibitor, which I'm not even sure if we had it on there, but you know, it's another drug that we can use that treats uh, psoriatic arthritis, and we'll, we'll see how she does, but, uh, you know, over time, uh, sometimes the medications just stop working for people. 
and you have to change therapy. Um, Stacy Keller on Facebook is asking, if topical treatments are not working for mild or moderate scalp psoriasis, are there other treatments, treatment options? Yeah, absolutely. So scalp psoriasis is something that we see quite often. We definitely see isolated cases of scalp psoriasis. Maybe we have a few photos of a couple sure. of different cases that, that can show you the varying severity. One case is much thicker, much scalier. And topical steroids are usually a great place to start, but for these sensitive areas, even if someone has a small body surface area of one or two percent of their body, but in a sensitive area like the scalp, the face, the genitals, the hands, particularly painful psoriasis, that's absolutely an indication to start either a pill medication like the Tesla or to start an injectable biologic agent. Um, because these newer medications, we most of the time can pretty much clear psoriasis. I mean, we're getting to an era now where people shouldn't have to live with psoriasis. There were discussions before where you would say, okay, a patient has 3% body surface area, we're really happy. They used to have 50% BSA coverage of psoriasis, now they're down to three. That's awesome, that's a huge win. And now people are saying, well, well maybe if they have 3% BSA for six months, it's time to switch classes of medications to do something different because maybe we can do even better. So it, it's, it's never a great time to have a disease, but if you have psoriasis, I mean, these new medications have really yeah, been- Yeah, a lot, a lot better therapies. Uh, would, again, when I was in training, methotrexate was really in favor. Mm -hmm. in, you know, the problem with methotrexate, even though it's a great drug, if you're a woman who's taking it, you could you know, have a spontaneous abortion with the medication. Uh, it's not indicated for, for pregnancy. Absolutely. And, and acetretin is another drug that, that I've used in the past for psoriasis, but again, same thing, you can't use it in women who are of childbearing age. Yeah, for three years after taking it, you can have a birth defect. This next case is a, a good example of how some of these newer medications can work. So the before picture, this young man had probably about 70% body surface area, really thick, scaly psoriasis. Psoriasis was so painful, he actually went to the emergency department and he got a ton of IV steroids, which certainly helped in the moment, but IV steroids can be a massive trigger for a horrible psoriasis outbreak. So then by the time I saw him, even the areas that didn't have psoriasis were bright red skin, he was borderline erythrodermic, which is a term that we use to describe total body erythema and redness. And that's kind of a psoriasis emergency. So, no so when I see those patients, I take them really seriously. Dr. Greenberg and I tag team this case actually because um, one of us was out of town during the time and I don't remember how it went, but one of us started him on a TNF alpha agent because we, we had samples. We could start him the same day. So we checked his blood work, we got him started on samples, and then I think I, I did a handoff and I started him on cyclosporin yep. and I saw him I think the next day because we like to give our patients that need close follow-up, close follow-up. I mean, if I have to see someone every single day or every single week, we'll do that until we can get them better to keep them out of the hospital. So because he had the prednisone, and as that's coming off, the psoriasis can really flare. We started a long, longer acting, a, a rather a slower acting, but a longer duration of therapy medication like the humor that he started. Sure. And then I put on the cyclosporin to really put the fire out. And this is within two months. We completely, completely cleared his skin. We took him off cyclosporin, which is a very effective, but in the long run, a toxic medication. We took him off cyclosporin within yep. four weeks. His skin was almost clear by then, and by two months later, his psoriasis was completely clear. He's very, very happy. Yeah, cyclosporin is a drug I haven't, I haven't used in a long time, but I had a patient who had been on cyclosporin for 10 years with, for his psoriasis, and really, you're only supposed to be on it for a year. Exactly. And this is when I was in training. And, you know, there, there are rules, and then sometimes you, you, you gotta go with it. You have to know what to look out for. So for, for that patient on cyclosporin, you check the kidneys, check the blood pressure, that type Absolutely. of thing. Um, Derm Q Bank on Instagram is asking, do you, use, do you ever use ILK for focal severe plaques on the scalp? Sure, yeah. Yeah, especially, uh, so ILK is intralesional chemolog, and chemolog is a steroid. The problem with steroids is you can leave a little divot wherever you inject and you can get blood vessels to the surface. That said, it's very effective. I even know doctors who will inject in the, the joints of the fingers. Uh, I, I personally don't like to inject there, but if you have to, you have to. Yeah. Periodically, I'll inject thick plaques on the hands because it, it works faster than anything else. It is painful, though, to have those injections in the, the hand plaques. Um, one of your top fans on Facebook, Carrie Pender, says, can psoriasis bumps have pustules? Pus pustules. Yes. So pustular psoriasis yeah. you know, is something that we see. It's a very severe case. Um, certainly systemic agent is warranted in that. Yeah, actually some of the most uh, most terrifying cases of pustular psoriasis I've seen have been after a patient's come off steroids. And um, I've had two cases since I've joined Dr. Greenberg here at Las Vegas Dermatology in the last year where someone came in from the community and they'd put on prednisone or 
or similar medication for either their psoriasis that was misdiagnosed as eczema or something, and then by the time they're seeing me, they're flaring and they're getting pustules all over all of their plaques, and that's that's really an emergency. That's about to tip over into erythroderma, and and pustular psoriasis can be a very scary disease, and it needs to be taken extremely seriously. Sure, and erythroderma, just for everybody else, is just where your whole body is red, and sometimes when your whole body is red. You don't know what, what the cause of that is. Is it mycosis fungoides, which is a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma? Is it psoriasis? Is it a drug rash? Uh, you, you, there's a whole differential. Knowing that you had psoriasis before you go erythrodermic is quite helpful. Because <laughs> yeah. then uh, you can avoid some of the other, Absolutely. The other things. So this is one of those cases that I was talking about. This gentleman um, is actually on an IL-17 inhibitor. He, he ended up going on to Cosentix because He's had psoriasis for about eight years. He also has psoriatic arthritis um, badly in his hands. And I, I do a joint exam on every patient that I have with psoriatic arthritis when it's in their hands. Because the hand exam is quick enough and I feel comfortable enough to do it. And we ordered the x-rays and he had joint disease and joint damage. And no one had ever started him on a medication. And the reason why is his medical history is complicated. He has a history of hepatocellular carcinoma, so liver cancer. And he's actually had to have a liver transplant because of that. And so with that type of history, you have to be very careful. You know, a TNF alpha inhibitor might not be the best medicine for sure. him because you worry about recurrence. But at the same time, his joints were being destroyed. He couldn't work with his hands. And we talked a lot about the different options and decided that an IL-17 inhibitor would be um, both effective and safe for him. And this is within five weeks of starting the IL-17 inhibitor. His um, plaques rapidly cleared, which is one of the reasons why I like that class of medications. They, sure. they do have data for rapid clearance. Um, but to your point, Dr. Greenberg, sometimes we have to get a little fancy and a little complicated because even two months into his Cosentix therapy, he was still having worsening joint pain. Sure. And so last month we actually added Otezolam. That's what I was going to say because that would be perfect because you can have one drug treat the psoriasis, the other treat the psoriatic arthritis, even though they both you can treat both. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's a perfect choice for this one. Yeah, he's, he's doing great. In the past, I probably would have wanted to use a medication like methotrexate. Um, because that's excellent for psoriatic arthritis, but with a history of liver transplant, no, that medication is... Yeah, you'd have to do a liver biopsy after, well, they're, they're thinking may have changed, but you know, when I was training at one and a half grams, and I'm not writing as much methotrexate as I used to, uh, but one thing that we are doing in the clinic here at Las Vegas Dermatology is we're, uh, we have a registry that we're enrolling all of our patients on biologics on called the Corona Study, mm -hmm. the Corona Registry, and what happens is uh, there is some compensation for the patient just to be a part of it, but this registry is going to help future patients who have psoriasis just to see which drugs are the most effective and how people do on them. And long term, I think it would be useful. We're doing a research study with, uh, with Celgene for genital psoriasis. We have a study that's up and coming with uh, Novartis for lichen planus. Uh, we've got the PROSE study with uh, Regeneron. So our studies are increasing. And, and the more patients we see and that we can get enrolled in these studies, the better it will be for the future. Absolutely. So this is, I think, a good example of someone with really thick psoriatic plaques. Do you have any tips or tricks for patients that maybe just want to stick on topical? Sure. They don't want a biologic, but they want something that's really great for the skin. There's, there's a number of, of uh, different topical therapies. So in a, in a space like this, if it was just this area, there's a topical called uh, Duobri. I do speak for the company. Um, and it is a, uh, uh, a retinoid topical and a uh, hypoxy steroid, and it's in a very nice vehicle that, that can be applied to the skin, and it should thin out the plaques. Uh, there's another one called Instalar or Taclinex, the same, the same drug, which is a vitamin D and a steroid combined. Uh, I like the combination therapies. You can do just topical steroids and then switch over to something like Sorolux, which is a topical vitamin D. Uh, or just a topical retinoid. Topical retinoids uh, tend to cause a little bit of irritation. And I had a patient who, um, I put her on a topical, the Duobri, which I think is a, a great drug, but you know it flared her because of the, the retinoid component. It doesn't do it to everybody because the steroid helps. So every patient's different and everybody responds differently. I completely agree with you. Anytime you can have a medication that has two drugs in one. It just makes it so much easier for patients to use and apply. And when we can get them covered, we, we like to use them. Now, what if this was a patient, maybe a pregnant patient, with bad enough psoriasis that you're thinking of a systemic agent? Is there, is there a go-to medicine that you think would be best, safest? Sure, so there is, there's a drug, I also speak for this company too. Um, it's called Asimsia, it's by UCB. 
And it's another TNF alpha inhibitor, but it's missing a component that transfers across the placenta. So it's thought to be safer during pregnancy, and they've done a number of studies. Uh, and it's, again, TNF alpha, so it's for psoriasis and for psoriatic arthritis. So for the pregnant patient, that's my go-to. The other drugs, uh, before they stop the pregnancy categories, uh, Humira and Enbro were other drugs that I would use during pregnancy. Perfect, me too. Um, Clive Bollinger on Facebook is asking, is psoriasis more likely in your future if a family member had it? Yes, absolutely. So psoriasis can run in families, and there's even some uh, specific genetic markers that have increased risk of early onset and more severe psoriasis. They're called the, the PSOR or SOAR loci within the genome, and there's one called SOAR6 that's uh, particularly um, increased susceptibility. There's also some specific mutations in genes like CARD15 that can result in early onset psoriasis. Outside of that, psoriasis can still run in families without a specifically identifiable um, genetic change, but there's definitely an increased risk. So if someone in your family has psoriasis, you, you may have a higher risk. Yeah, I think now's a good time also to mention there is a foundation for psoriasis called the Psoriasis Foundation, National Psoriasis Foundation, and uh, they have resources for people with psoriasis. It's an advocacy group. Uh, we contribute as an organization to that uh, organization. Yeah, and Dr. Greenberg does a lot of outreach, actually, uh, specifically to Here's one of us. Oh, yeah. So I gave a talk at the uh, National Psoriasis Foundation meeting in, at the Flamingo Hotel a number of years ago with Carrie D. English, who's, who was America's Next Top Model. She had psoriasis. She was the national spokesperson at one point in time for the National Psoriasis Foundation, and I met her at the meeting. And uh, that was it, was, it was great to see somebody who had so much of her body involved and really was shunned as a child uh, to get on a drug, talk about the change in her life, how she was able to become America's Next Top Model despite having this condition that you know, had her teased and in all kinds of trouble as a, as a child. So psoriasis doesn't discriminate, it can show up anywhere in the body. We're keeping the talk PG, so we included some pictures of feet here, but it can also be on the genitals, and some of those sensitive sites require sensitive care. And, and we are doing a genital psoriasis study here in the office, so uh, if somebody does have genital psoriasis, we're not currently enrolling because of the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, so that, that trial is on hold only for patients who are in it, but it will be um, re-enrolling patients so if you do have genital psoriasis, you may be able to get free drug uh, in our plan. But this is on the feet. Uh, if somebody just had it on their feet, uh, you could use just a topical, although I had a patient today who, um, she had stopped her Otesla, and it's just on her feet, but it's debilitating for her. So she also has uh, joint pain, so that's for her. Sorry. Um, Sue Holopoff Campbell says, hi, Dr. G. Um, Julia on Instagram is asking, when is Botox back? And then Lucy K. Diolio Rodriguez is asking, do you accept health plan of Nevada insurance? Yeah, we do. Uh, we don't, there are certain HMOs we don't accept. Uh, the office, just go to lvderm.com or uh, call the office at 702-456-3120. And it's, sometimes these things change. You know, we're doing some telemedicine visits for people who are uh, concerned about the virus and not coming into the clinic. Uh, we do have the social distancing set up with the chairs and the pre-screening and you know, temperature checks. Uh, when the governor opens the state up, then we are looking forward to giving our talks on Botox and fillers and carbon dioxide resurfacing lasers. I mean, during this uh, quarantine, uh, Dr. Cotter did uh, laser resurfacing of my face. I got two uh, Venus Viva treatments, microneedling. Um, there's just a ton that can be done. Uh, we just need the governor. Right to, before the quarantine. Right before, well, yeah, but uh, exactly. But once everything's opened up, then, then uh, the world's your oyster. Yes, and you guys can call the office right now because the lines are still oh, on. Oh, the lines are open. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. You're <laughs> Oh, I love this. This is one of my favorites. Uh, it says, uh, Slim has a dry, scaly patch on his neck. Ride to town and bring the dermatologist. I just think that's funny. It's great, and, it, and, it's, and it's, it's also kind of timely. I mean, here we are in Las Vegas. It's not quite the Wild West. It's not a, a wide open frontier. But in terms of what's changed in the landscape of psoriasis, I mean, you can still be a little bit of a cowboy, Dr. Greenberg. You can give someone the history of uh, liver cancer, sure. biologic medication, and, and change their life. Ten years ago, they would have said, you're crazy and you're a cowboy, but now it's something that's safe to do, and you can really help people. No, and that's true. And we have seen people 
um, you know, coming in or they don't know what they have. And you know, uh, during this quarantine, we've, we've remained open for essential cases. And doing what we do and how we do it, we've been able to diagnose some amazing cases that otherwise would have gone to the emergency room and not been properly diagnosed. Some really difficult and challenging cases. So uh, yeah, we, we love what we do and we love treating psoriasis and all other skin conditions. Uh, these are just some pictures that we wanted to throw up of our team when we didn't have to wear masks uh, of our office. And then uh, we have been doing the, um, the COVID-19 testing. We've so far tested over 150 people and we've had five people test IgG positive. Among them, I'm one of them uh, for having been exposed to the virus and having antibodies. So it's an important a thing in order to open up the state is to document sort of where we're at and are there new infections or not new infections. But uh, we're, we're doing our part. And if you think you've been exposed, it may be worthwhile to get tested just for peace of mind. Absolutely. Beach Bum 1020 said, yay to round four. And then Derma Net said, very nice to see you're live again. Cha cha cha. <laughs> Um, are there any other questions out there? Correct me. No. All right. Well, thanks for joining us for Durham Bros. Round 4. Yeah, this has been fantastic. Doctor. Doctor. And uh, we're open to other topics. So if there's something out there that you're interested in, you know, info at lvderm.com. Uh, you, can, you can send an email. You can post on our Instagram or Facebook page. There have been a lot of posts recently uh, from people who have had some political commentary. You know, we, we don't get political. We treat Republicans, Democrats, independents, uh, basically anybody who has a skin condition we're gonna treat. We're not looking to uh, define anybody's political whatever. If you have skin, you're in. Right, that's pretty much that's, it. That's kind of where we draw the line. If you got yeah. skin, come on in. Yeah, we can, we can take care of that. But you know, anything else, uh, we're, 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 we're not in that business. We're in the business of making skin look better for a healthier, more beautiful life. And we sort of, uh, it, we, we certainly enjoy doing this, and uh, we appreciate your watching us. Um, do you guys offer TCA crosses? Yeah, actually that's something that, that I've done a fair amount of. Um, it's technically cosmetic treatment to help remodel scars. Um, TCA cross is where you take trichloroacetic acid, or TCA, and you very delicately and very specifically apply it to generally ice pick scars. And the cross stands for chemical reconstruction of scars, so TCA cross. Usually people need a series of treatments spaced about four weeks apart. In between, sometimes the scars can look a little worse, but you use the TCA to cause actually additional scarring of these scars, and then they remodel. You induce collagen production, and they look better over time. It's a, it's a great treatment for acne ice pick scars, and I, when I can, I love to combine it with CO2 resurfacing. So sure. I'll do the TCA cross to the specific scars, and then do CO2 resurfacing over at the same time I'll even take a, a, a blunt needle and I'll do subcision of the area. So a common area to see that is on the cheeks mm -hmm. and we'll do local lidocaine to infiltrate it. I'll cut all of those scars underneath the skin through one tiny entry point that doesn't leave a scar and it releases those fibrous bands and then I'll do TCA cross on half and laser over it. And for patients that don't like laser, I don't know if if, uh, if you've been doing this too Dr. Greenberg, but I like to put in a little filler sure. after I subside. So then you subsize the fiber spans and they float up and you put a filler layer right underneath so that way they don't read here. Yeah, there's no, there's no quick fix for that. We, we talked last week about uh, skin cancer and scars, so you don't want to check out the round three where we, where we talked about that stuff or just make an appointment and come in. Everybody's situation is different and we have the Venus Viva and some other tools as well. Um, Divorce Muse says, what's up, cuz? Looking good. Dermanet said, very nice and brave explanation. Bravo. Well said. You have skin pro, you're in. And then I also have another funny little question from an Instagram follower saying, when are you getting a new Corvette? And then I also have D. Michelle asking, would you be able to do the TCA cross on type 4 skin? Well, it depends. If you truly are type four, we have to be a little more cautious. In general, TCA is much safer from a hyperpigmentation standpoint compared to some of the other peeling agents that are out there, like glycolic acid peels, and there have been um, actually some head-to-head -head studies that have looked at that. So if I was going to pick a peeling agent for a darker skin type patient, 
Um, for the purpose of SCARS, I'd probably go with TCA. Um, phenol might be an option. We're not currently offering phenol fuels here because they have a whole different set of risk factors. But that might be a nice option for you elsewhere. Um, Carissa Ferreri uh -huh. said, what's on your guys' socks? <laughs> well, we each wore something different. I wanted to go with two different socks, but I couldn't find a proper one. I've but got dinosaurs, compliments of Dr. Greenberg. He knows I like uh, ancient animals, so he would go with some nice dino socks today. Yeah. And I just went red. Red and white today. It's yeah. simple. It's my red day today. Awesome. I believe that is all the questions that we have. Oh, just kidding. I saw one. This one wasn't um, related to, but now I guess we can ask it. It says, can Accutane help with folliculitis? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's the right treatment for yeah. uh, special type Gram of folliculitis. Gram-negative folliculitis. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, it depends what you have, but there's, uh, you know, we've got people on Accutane. It's, it's not a fun drug to write. It used to be a lot more fun to write. It's a federally regulated drug. We only send it to Choice Pharmacy here in uh, Las Vegas because it's just a challenging drug to write, and there's a, a federal program to do. Um, Tracy Sharon said, love the colorful socks with long hair doctors. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And then, oh, yeah, and then there was another one that said that um, Marlene Salanga Naito said, hello there, handsome doctors. Oh, hi, Marlene. Thank you. What's everybody <laughs> doing for Memorial Day weekend? Where are you traveling to? <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. I think I'll be... Touring the living room and the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, that's part of From the TV to the fridge. <laughs> yeah, it sounds very nice. Yeah, that sounds like a plan. All right. Well, I think that's it. So, well, Doc, cheers. 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 Been great. Oh, sorry, you guys got a last oh, question. We have a last minute question. <laughs> last minute edition. Um, SB Skin LV said, "Is there a possible link with celiac disease and keratosis polaris?" Thank you. I value your advice. Yeah, there's a lot of different manifestations of celiac disease in the skin, one of which is actually something called dermatitis herpetiformis, which is an extremely itchy skin disease that usually you get tiny small blisters. Not everyone gets the blister, sometimes you can just have the itch. Keratosis pilaris is just a very, very common skin disease that's sometimes associated with atopic dermatitis or atopic eczema, which in of itself isn't related to celiac as far as I know, but it may just be that patients with celiac disease um, have another common condition called keratosis pilaris, which is kind of a sensitive skin condition. Sure, just plugging up the hair follicles, and it's a, it's a difficult condition to treat, where even at its best, may improve 30 to 40 percent. Yeah, I do have patients with keratosis pilaris who have told me, they say, you know, I don't know if I have celiac disease, but when I do eat gluten, my arms are bumpier, my legs are bumpier, and it seems to be a trigger. Uh, for patients that do have KP, it's one of those things. It's if you have brown hair and you want blonde hair, you have to color your hair and vice versa. And so for people that have KP that are really bothered by it, we can do superficial chemical peels that'll help smooth out the skin. So a lot of times, you know, outside of quarantine, when you actually have prom or you have a wedding and you're gonna wear a uh, sleeveless dress or you just wanna have nice smooth skin for a special occasion, it's great to come in and do a superficial chemical peel and kind of exfoliate all of those plug hair follicles and plug pores, it'll, it'll smooth it out and last a few weeks. Yeah, and we sell the Clarisonic brush, you can try that on the arms that may help a little bit you could try like a hydrofacial on the arms to, to clean it out uh, nothing works great but you can improve it. it and then Valerie Coop said thank you for the invite it's very good to hear from you guys and she misses you I miss you too awesome do you have a question it says <laughs> Sorry. Maybe it's a foreign language. No, it says, no. I went to A of U Michigan game and got a rash. Is, <laughs> is that normal? <laughs> he said, never had a rash before then. <laughs> hey, I wonder if your team lost to Michigan. Maybe that was it. I don't know. Maybe it was the after party. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Good event. Or pre-party, pre-game. There you go. Yeah, all right. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate it, and uh, we're open to your suggestions for our next round. Yeah. Till next time. Awesome.